Well, Slavoj Žižek, uh, there's no better introduction to Slavoj Žižek than Slavoj Žižek himself, so I can only sit here as a mere kind of parody uh, in, in, in some respects. And uh, part of his success, actually, um, you should never try and explain something complicated with something more complicated, which is what I risk here. But uh, part of Žižek's success is as, in a way, a kind of popularizer of Lacan and his a uh, very astute and creative ability to condense a lot of Lacan's difficult ideas into very simple little analogies, often using film, for example. He was born in 49 and came onto the scene in the sort of late uh, uh, 80s. He was a Slovene national, and um, uh, during this period under Tito's Yugoslavia, uh, there was a strong nationalist element. Žižek, in the early days, was, uh, he was interested in philosophy. This was his first degree. And he was very interested in Heidegger. Now, of course, Heidegger you can read in one of two ways. You could read him as this sort of great nationalist, sort of, you know, the Volks, the, you know, getting back to the earth, this kind of thing. Or you can read him in a very leftist kind of way, of somebody, you know, the openness of being, the contingency of life, the event, etc., etc. Žižek's reading of Heidegger was very much on the left-hand side, and that put him at odds with the authorities in Slovenia at the time. Uh, and that meant that he was really you know, um, prevented from teaching, having students, etc., which led him into all sorts of strange positions in an attempt to try and get his ideas and thoughts out there. Um, he explains that he used to write uh, reviews for books that um, uh, that he'd never written, and then include his own self-criticism, just to sort of, you know, try and publicise himself surreptitiously in this way. Um, after uh, uh, it was during this period in, so that he went to uh, Paris, where he then went to study with Jacques Alain Millier, who was Lacan's son-in-law and the sort of, you know, the bastion of Lacan's estate. And um, and here he sort of undertook his study of Lacan, and really produces something quite remarkable. And it's remarkable for two reasons. Firstly, as I say, the way it's able to condense Lacan's difficult thought into practical and, and fun examples. Um, and secondly, the way it was able to integrate German idealistic thought with Lacanian psychoanalysis to try and create a much more revolutionary approach to thinking about the problem of ideology. Now you could say, uh, if you took the case, the case of a, uh, the analysand, for example, who has some kind of strange fantasy that ends up structuring all their human relationships. Why am I always in a relationship where I'm treated like a piece of shit? You know, what is it about that sort of, that feeling of being a leftover that structures all my relationships? Well, there's going to be a basic fundamental fantasy, not unlike sort of the screen behind me, which is going to sort of order and structure all of that. And you could say that the problem of a fantasy arises within the 21st century vis-a-vis -vis capitalism, because one of the big problems that uh, Zizek poses is, is, is how do we think outside the capitalist hegemony that exists? Um, uh, you know, he uses, he, he, he gives us a, a little thought experiment. You know, can you imagine a Hollywood film, a cultural imagination of the Western world? Um, can you imagine a Hollywood film set in a post-capitalist society? Well, actually, we can't. We find it easier to make films about the end of the world than we do imagine what a post-capitalist society is like. And so the problem, the political problem, is not that different from the psychoanalytic problem. How do you puncture what people say to try and get and open up a new space for thought? Um, you can imagine, for example, the person that has a particular neurotic action. Well, as long as you're doing that neurotic action, you're not going to go to the analyst. It's only when that neurotic action stops working that you're going to go to the analyst. And then, paradoxically, you're going to ask the analyst, if you can have your neurosis back, because that was the thing that made you function. Whereas actually what you really need to be doing is really getting to the bottom of things and understanding what structures you in such a way as to 
create that fantasy in the first place. So the psychoanalytic problem is parallel to the ideological problem. You know, how do we break through these assumptions that various truths are naturalized to create a new space for thinking? And um, as I say, this is uh, largely filtered through Marx and German idealism, Hegel in particular. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the ways you can look at modernity and particularly the Enlightenment, is that uh, within modernity we, we suddenly discovered rationality and reason and thereafter would set ourselves on the great course towards Logos, etc. But actually the Enlightenment and modernity, there's two different ways of reading that. One is that the human being is basically a rational person and can use their powers of rationality to create a nice, peaceful society. But the other one, the other tradition, one to which Freud uh, belonged, uh, and in particular Hegel, was that actually we began to discover that at the heart of the human subject was a certain form of kind of madness, something, you know, quite sort of irrational. Um, you know, what Hegel called, you know, the dark night of the soul, these sort of strange dark places that are actually very sort of constitutive of us. So in the same way that Lacan was beginning to describe the subject, uh, you know, describe the subject as being um, you know, a feature of language and having all these paradoxical desires, etc. We have something similar that we can start to find in the way that German idealism is presenting the subject. So we've got a kind of natural marriage, actually, between these two disciplines, German idealism and uh, Lacan. But there's a third aspect in all of this, which, of course, is Christian theology. Because we're dealing with capitalism and ideology here. Now, remember that um, uh, Marxists have uh, never been sort of great big uh, fans of Christians, even if uh, Christian liberation theologians were only too happy to uh, learn from Marx. But um, Marx sort of famously turned Hegel on his head. All those kinds of idealist aspirations that Hegel had, well, we need to sort of get, ri get rid of them and think about the real dialectic between um, you know, the proletariat and those who own the means of production. Now, what Zizek does is, is very surprising because in the same way that Marx said that the first critique of society has to be the critique of religion um, because religion was you know, the, sort of the, the mythical means by which we hold the people in their uh, position of slavery, etc. We can always tell them you'll have a better life in heaven and therefore you can justify your suffering in this life. Zizek also thinks that if we're going to critique capitalism, we need to begin with Christianity. But what is it about Christianity? And here he's following Hegel's trajectory. And in particular, Hegel's sort of canonic logic of the cross. What happens is that when God dies on the cross, what dies on the cross is not simply God as such, but really the God of the beyond. Um, uh, you know, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Or not Father, God, God, why hast thou forsaken me? What dies on the cross is not God as such, but the God of the beyond. The possibility that there is this great big kind of metaphysical first principle key holder which makes the world meaningful, such that were you to unlock it, the whole world would just sort of fall apart. What dies on the cross is not God as such, but the God of the beyond. So this is a post-metaphysical reading of Christianity. So what then is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is simply the community of believers, or uh, to put it in Marxist terms, the collective. Now, we need to follow the logic here. We need to follow the logic carefully. There's something that Zizek's getting at in theology that's actually very materialistic. We tend to think of theology, we recall Nietzsche's critique, for example, that um, Christian theology was far too world-denying but actually there's something very materialistic within uh, theology. And um, uh, one of the readers that um, Zizek draws on quite heavily is the Catholic apologetic um, apologist G.K. G. K. Chesterton. And uh, Chesterton sort of famously says that, um, you know, if you get rid of God, 
you end up with superstition. Um, you know, suddenly a cat, a black cat becomes this sort of sign of, of, of bad luck if it crosses you. If you get rid of God, you end up with superstition. But if you believe in God, and you believe in the incarnation, God is God, man is man, cat is cat, dog is dog. There's something very world and materially affirming about what it is to be a Christian, certainly in Chesterton's views. So we can say that there's a materialist element within Christianity. And, um, and remember that there's a sort of, you know, there's a materialist element within psychoanalysis uh, in the sense that psychoanalysis is about speech. It's the, you know, it's the talking cure. It's listening to what we say. The unconscious is not hidden. It's all out there in the language. So we need a kind of materialist reading. 